Now, I am uh, absolutely convinced that the main source of hatred in the world is religion and organized religion. Absolutely convinced of it. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. So when I say, as the subtitle of my book, that I think religion poisons everything, I'm not just doing what publishers like and coming up with a provocative subtitle. I mean to say it infects us in, the, in our most basic integrity. It says we can't be moral without Big Brother, without a totalitarian permission. It means we can't be good to one another. It means we can't think with, without this. We, we must be afraid. We must also be forced to love someone who we fear, the essence of sadomasochism, uh, the essence of abjection, the essence of the master-slave relationship, and that knows that death is coming and can't wait to bring it on. I say this is evil, and uh, though I do some nights stay home, I enjoy more uh, the nights when I go out and fight against this ultimate wickedness and ultimate stupidity. Is it not the case that the spread of Christianity about which you spoke so warmly and effectively in your opening remarks, attributing it to its in, the innate truth of the Bible story, uh, was spread by that means or because the Emperor Constantine decided to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire? Which, in your view, contributed more to the spread of the faith? Uh, the Holy Spirit. I rest my case. <laughs> You give me the awful impression, I hate to have to say it, of someone who hasn't read any of the arguments against your position ever. So what if God actually exists, sir? Would he not have been good to you? No. Uh, he wouldn't. Because if, if that were true, it would mean that I had an eternal supervising parent who would never die and let me get on with my life, never let me grow up, who keep me under surveillance. But you have, sir. I supervision every, every minute of my but, life but and, you constantly have. Ask, and constantly ask me to be thanking and praising him. Yeah. I well, think it would that be wasn't part like, of the scenario. Like living in North Korea. I, I, I think it would be a horrible outcome. Well, not sure that, that, that God is Kim Jong-il, but what if what I said is well, true? Well, Kim Jong-il, he has a different opinion. Let's say that the consensus is that our species, we being the higher primates, um, Homo sapiens, have been, has been on the planet for at least 100,000 years. In order to be a Christian, you have to believe that for 98,000 years, our species suffered and died, most of its children dying in childbirth, most other people having a life expectancy of about 25, dying of their teeth, famine, struggle, bitterness, war, suffering, misery, all of that. For 98,000 years, heaven watches it with complete indifference. And then 2,000 years ago, thinks, that's enough of that. We should, it's time to intervene. The best way to do this would be by condemning someone to a human sacrifice somewhere in the less literate parts of the Middle East. Not, don't, let's appear to the Chinese, for example, where people can read and study evidence and have a civilization. Let's go to the desert and have another revelation there. This is nonsense. You, it, it can't be believed by a thinking person. If it was true, it would have two further implications. It would have to mean that the designer of this plan was unbelievably lazy and inept, or unbelievably callous, and cruel, and indifferent, and capricious. And that is the case with every argument for design and every argument for revelation and intervention that has ever been made. All of this could be part of a plan. There is no way an atheist can prove it's not. But it's some plan, isn't it? With mass destruction, pitiless extermination, uh, annihilation going on all the time, and all of this set in motion on a scale that's absolutely beyond our imagination in order that the Pope can tell people not to jerk off. <laughs> In his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he said, it's a very severe crisis which, which involves us, he said, in the following, in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care. Well, I'm sorry. They've already had that. <laughs> the rape and torture of children is not something to be relativized. It's not something to be excused as a few bad priests. It's the crime that cries out for punishment. It's the thing that if we were accused of on this side of the house, we would die rather than admit. And if we were guilty of it, we'd kill ourselves. Your, your view 
would be the same as mine, that child sacrifice is reprehensible, would it not? Did Abraham think child sacrifice was an okay idea? He obeyed God and God intervened. The, the, the ultimate question is, does God think child sacrifice, since he sent his own son to be the ultimate sacrifice? Well, I he mean, appears to be in favor of it. He does appear to be in favor of it, but in I context. I agree that we were not. Uh, I'm asking. And, uh, not scorning the, the three delightful children who result, who are everything to me and who are my only chance of a, even a glimpse of a, a second life, let alone an immortal one. And I'll tell you something, if I was told to sacrifice them to prove my devotion to God, if I was told to do what all monotheists are told to do and admire the man who said, yes, I'll gut my kid to show my love of God, I'd say, no, fuck you. <laughs> what about Fräulein Freisel in Austria, whose father unwilling to get out of the way, kept her in a dungeon where she didn't see daylight for 24 years and came down most nights to rape and to sodomize her, often in front of the children who were the victims of the previous attacks and offenses. Imagine how she must have begged him. Imagine how she must have pleaded. Imagine for how long. Imagine how she must have prayed every day, how she must have beseeched heaven. Imagine, for 24 years, and no, no answer at all. Nothing, nothing. Now, you say that's all right that she went through that because she'll get a better deal in another life. Are you, I have to ask you if you, if you can be morally or ethically serious and postulate such a question. No, that had to happen. And heaven did watch it with indifference because it knows that that score will later on be settled. So it was well worth her going through it. She'll have a better time next time. I don't see how you can look anyone, anyone in the face or live with yourself and say anything so hideously, wickedly immoral as that, or even implied. There, that's my answer. Do you believe that that God, if he's provided everything for you, has rights on your life? No. Because? Why should he? What well, gives him his right? Because he owns you. He's created everything for you. He's kept well, you alive. Want to be owned. I don't want to be owned, and I don't recognize anyone's right to own me. So ownership is a bad thing? Of people, yes. Oh, okay. It's been widely considered. I mean, I know, I know the Bible does call for slavery, as it calls for genocide, but that doesn't make it right. It is a horrible idea that there is somebody who owns us, who makes us, who supervises us, waking and sleeping, who knows our thoughts, who can convict us of thought crime, who can do thought crime just for what we think, uh, who can judge us while we sleep, for things that might occur to us in our dreams, who can create us sick, as apparently we are, and then order us on pain of eternal torture to be well again. Th to demand this, to wish this to be true, is to wish to live as an abject slave. You've made the worst concession already. You've already said you're a slave. So well, absolutely. Uh, after I, that, I, after I, that. Mere, mere obedience to orders is a, is a small offense. I readily admit that I'm a slave. I'm a slave of uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad of your chains. Yeah, well... Uh, it's absolutely fine for you, but you must leave me out of it. I don't want to be told that I have to obey these laws too, or that my children have to be taught this in school, or that laws have to be written to ratify the the bizarre beliefs of a cult like yours. Well, but... That's the thing I would need you to understand. You're, you're quite sure. happy to believe this. Why can't you keep it to yourself? Uh, I'm, why can't you keep your atheism to yourself? Because the religious won't allow me to. Because every time I open the paper, there's another instance of theocratic encroachment on free society, which I won't put up with. Up with which I will not put. Well, that's clear. What about the most important minority in the history of the world? Those who have never believed in God. Those who believe that an ethical life is possible without religion. We have to be insulted and outraged every day by what we see and what we read by slaughter and murder. Slaughter and murder and barbarism and insult and, and superstitious nonsense. We do not reply in kind. We don't say, we'll go and kill you if you go on insulting us like this. Do we get no credit for saying this? When, when has anyone ever said, what's it like to be insulted as someone who thinks that civilization is a real thing? Why is it always interfaith? Why is it always interdenominational? Why can't we say that all of these cults are equal and equivalent glimpses of the untrue. I know what's coming. I know no one beats these odds. And it's a matter of getting used to that and growing up and realizing that you're expelled from your mother's uterus as if shot from a cannon towards a barn door studded with old nail files and rusty hooks. 
It's a matter of how you use up the intervening time in an intelligent and ironic way and try not to do everything ghastly to your fellow creatures. I think it will one day be admitted with shame that it might have been in error to say that AIDS is bad as a disease, very bad, but not quite as bad as condoms are bad, or not as immoral in the same way. I say it, I say it in the presence of His Grace, and I say it to His face, the preachings of His Church are responsible for the death and suffering and misery of millions of his brother and sister Africans. And he should apologize for it. He should show some, some shame. There's another immoral injunction. Go love your own enemies. Don't be loving mine. My enemies are the theocratic fascists. I, I don't love them. I want to destroy them. For condemning my friend Stephen, Stephen Fry for his nature. For saying, for saying you couldn't be a member of our church. You're born in sin. He's not being condemned for what he does. He's being condemned for what he is. You're a child made in the image of God. Oh, no, you're not. You're a faggot. And you can't join your church and you can't go to heaven. This is disgraceful. It's inhuman. It's obscene. And it comes from a clutch of hysterical, sinister virgins who've already betrayed their charge in the children of their own church. I would posit to you, Christopher, that there is no fundamental difference between what the Israelites did to the Amalekites and their surrounding neighbors or enemies than what the United States did justly in going into Iraq, whether we did it principally for moral reasons. It certainly had a moral... Uh, can you possibly for one second be morally serious as a human being and say that? Well, yes, I can. We, we fulfill what, can we, we, what Iraqis did we exterminate? What Iraqis did we enslave? What Iraqi virgins did we keep for our soldiers? having killed the, the rest of their families. Well, what, what are you talking about, sir? But That's what you I took, said. You took up all the time for my answer with your long, rather unlettered question. Oh. If you want to get good people to do wicked things, you need religion. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that who, when they see a newborn baby arriving in their life, if anyone's ever thought, even myself, well, maybe there is something to this. Look at the, look at the perfection of this little bundle. But, but they said, I tell you what, though, before we go any further, we need to get a sharp knife or a stone from somewhere and start hacking away at the genitalia of this little bundle. Because if we don't, we uh, won't be doing God's will. Now, where is, no moral person would do such a thing unless they thought it was divinely warranted. Christopher, I've, I've got to call you down on refer, referring to circumcision as genital mutilation. My son cried more at his first haircut than he did at his bris. And statistically, you weren't doing it right then. <laughs> statistically, the, the only long-term effect that it seems to have on people is it increases their chances of winning a Nobel Prize. I can't, um, I can't find the, the um, compulsory uh, mutilation of the genitals of children as subject for humor in that way, or flippancy in that way. What if a Muslim was to say to you just now, my little girl cried more at her first haircut than when I cut off her clitoris? What would you think of me if I was to say such a disgusting thing? That a person as humane as yourself can sit here and, be, and think of that as a fit subject for humor shows what I mean. Religion makes morally normal people say and do disgusting and wicked things, and you've just proved my point for me. Well, I, I want to make it clear in our closing moments here, Christopher, I don't consider you an enemy. I don't consider you... Uh, but I'm very sorry to hear that. Well, I know, because you want me to be your enemy. And you're well, you are, no, you, excuse me, you are my enemy. Well, but you're not my enemy. Uh, I, I, how I, you can figure that? No, because I don't feel a need to have to silence Christopher Hitchin. But, well, it, you don't have a chance of doing that. I don't mean that at all, but I mean your, your, your preachments are evil, and they're a direct threat to the survival of civilization. So you, if you don't consider me an enemy, you don't know an enemy when you see or hear one.